Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to Ex Oriente, the new voice of Brotherhood. I am uh, your host, Eric Diamond. I'm your other host, Jason Van Dyke. And uh, uh, this has been a week. I'm actually coming off of some uh, summer vacation. I uh, I went to I I know I went to New York. Uh, hung out with my brother uh, Rudy Galvan of my mother lodge Oriental Thirty Three, who is now a New York Mason and a member of uh, Mariners Sixty Seven. That's pretty cool. Completely, and 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 I got to meet uh, my my uh, my brothers at uh, Independent Royal Arch Lodge Number Two. Uh, they did like a, a lovely cigar and scotch night at uh, at a at a bar, kind of. You know, uh, I don't know what you call it. I guess Central Park uh, 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 East. Okay. Like somewhere around there, but it was it was Schmancy. quite delightful. Always nice to hang out All with right. the brothers. Excellent, excellent. Um, and you recently went on vacation, but I was did that a while ago. Yeah, where'd you go? It's a while ago. I went to Japan. Went to Tokyo and Okinawa, or not Okinawa, uh, Osaka. Osaka. Uh, and then uh, came back, and then I think I spent a week at work, and then went back uh, on the road and went to northern Wisconsin and spent some time with family at a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. It was nice. Cool. Yeah. It was cool. And uh, so we thought we thought it'd be good to t- talk about like some uh, some light summer reading since it is you know like it's almost the end of summer. It's the dog days it is. of summer, I guess. But it is. Um, let me see. I would just say I haven't pulled up the comments window yet. I think, it was I think it was 105 yesterday was the uh, heat index here in D.C. yesterday. Ooh. It was an awfully humid day. I spent it uh, at the swimming pool of a uh, fine and esteemed brother um, <clears throat> and um, drinking. Um, have you guys had the, uh, the, the little uh, hard seltzers yet? You had a hard seltzer? No, that just seems like seltzer with vodka in it. I mean, what, you know. It is, and it's absolutely fantastic. 100 calories, right? 100 calories for a little tiny little thing like that. You don't feel like a bloated mess. Um, it was, it, they're fun. Uh, th- now, the bad part is, is that you keep drinking them thinking, these are refreshing. This is really nice. And then all of a sudden, you're staring at the sky wondering, how did I get down here? Yeah. So, yeah, but they're delicious. Uh, so I did. We did that. We it's like you're living the, the lyrics to "Once in a Lifetime," you know. Right? <laughs> really, same as it ever was. Really, same as, same it, ever. as it ever was. That's absolutely <laughs> right. And this is not my house. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is not my beautiful wife. It it was uh, it was pretty great. So but here's the thing: that. aren't those uh, seltzer things? Aren't they? Don't they have like like essentially like de beard beer in them? Isn't it like? Oh, I I I listen. I, I don't profess to understand or know the chemistry, Eric. What I do know is that I enjoy a mild to moderate buzz uh, while sitting <laughs> next to lukewarm body of water. Lovely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's that's what I know, and uh, and it was great. It it, it was uh, it was uh, effective. Um, <clears throat> we we went through. I think uh, there were six of us, seven of us. And uh, we went through um, uh, 2448, uh, near 100 of them. Whoa. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're sitting around for a long time, you know, from about noon to 11 o'clock at night. So. Oh, okay. But yeah. You're pacing yourself. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. It's a good time. Good time. Uh, just anybody who's not a Mason who's listening to this, uh, we're not all drunks. Um, just most of just, us. Just most of us. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, uh, summer reading. And um, um, do you happen to know, I my comments thing is showing that nobody's here. Which I is got fine. four people here. Oh, that's fine. Well, I, got, okay. I got four people here, it's, it's, although it's, one of them is me, so... Oh. <laughs> Well, that's good. It's kind of a it's kind of a summer summer evening. Sure, so, you know. Uh, it is. It is. Uh, you know, we are also in the middle of biennial session uh, for the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite oh. Southern Jurisdiction. Okay. So tomorrow, tomorrow is uh, tomorrow bright and shiny is Monday morning opening session. It's actually the public portion. Uh, Saturday, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, and we'll probably most of you watching later, or the, the three of you, maybe this is news to you. Um, 
a uh, new Grand Commander was elected, and it is uh, Jim Cole, James D. Cole from uh, Virginia, has been elected the new Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite in the Southern Jurisdiction. Uh, Jim uh, is past Grand Master of Virginia, 2001. Um, terrific guy. Hey, James Morgan's here. See? James Morgan's here. Oh, that's fantastic. That's all that counts. Jim's, uh, Jim's the SGIG in, uh, or was the SGIG in Virginia. Uh, past Grandmaster 2001. Uh, really, really, really nice guy. Great, uh, terrific leader. Um, it's going to do a great job. Um, That's cool. So I'm kind of excited. So, so just, I'm going just, uh, uh, going tomorrow. Going tomorrow to session and then a banquet on Tuesday night. So get to say congratulations to both he and the outgoing guy. Fantastic. Fun. And so, yeah. Uh, uh, concerning the outgoing guy. Um, yeah. D- d- Ronnie, good guy. Yeah, great guy. Uh, uh, my question is, I know in the North, they, there's like a mandatory retirement age. Is that, is that what's at there play is. here? Or is he just like, I've no. had it with you people. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's the, it's the latter. Uh, he doesn't like any of us. Now he, he, you know, he, uh, he has done it for, let's see, he was elected in 2003. Yeah. So, you know, uh, 15 years is, is an awful long time. To, to do one job um and so i think he had just gotten to the end of it and just said you know i'm ready to move on and do the next thing yeah. um in my company you, you do 15 years you get a rolex so i mean i know yeah so hopefully he, i'll hopefully. be there tomorrow <laughs> do i get a 10-year credit uh no damn it well sadly God. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they, they did 15 years, you know, and I think he just, he had just kind of gotten a little tired of doing the kind of the same thing. I don't um, blame And him. it was time for new blood and, and not just that, but leaders, um, le- leaders grow stale. And I think, you know, even, even in, from their perspective, they grow stale. Yeah. Um, and I think he had just said, you know what? Need need some new blood. Need a new it's voice. It's enough for the... already. It's enough. For... Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So you know, and it's exciting. Jim is Jim is a really good guy. So I think it's going to be great. I mean, uh, uh, Ronnie did a terrific job, and is is a, a personal friend and a and a mentor of mine, and I love him to death. And I'm super happy for him that he's retired. I know that he's really excited uh, yeah. <laughs> to be retired. Yeah. Yeah. He's got his uh, life back. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've always, you know, I've always said like I would never want the job of grandmaster, and that goes like yeah, times yeah, fifty yeah. to a guy like you know the SGIG. Yeah, right. Although you know, I gotta say, you know, uh, politically, like you know, we don't, and, and I know we don't talk a lot of too much about like Grand Lodge politics and things like that. But this is Washington D.C., and we're all really interested in that kind of stuff. But politically, you know, I've always said <clears throat> is that. Um, they, they, they meet in this tiny little room in the house of the temple called the executive chamber. And there's only, there's only 33 seats in there. Um, and that includes the big grand commander's seat up in the East. And, um, I've always said, as soon as you make it into that room as a sovereign grand inspector general, as an SGIG, you sit in that room. That's the, the moment it dawns into your head. Hey, I could be the grand commander. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be grand commander. Yeah. Like it's the first time I think they allow themselves to have that fantasy because it's such a, it's such a quantum leap to get well, it's, into that it's room like all the, that it's once all you the, get into the room, yeah, right, it's, you go, oh, that's mine. And it's they like used to all, say that about the the Senate. I was gonna say it's like all the cardinals, like you know, get right. into the Sistine so, oh, Chapel, right? Yeah, and it's all they all right. look around in the room and go, how's this gonna shot. work? <laughs> yep. I, I got a shot. So yeah, absolutely. And so, <clears throat> so uh, you know, it's a big deal. I would never want to do it either. I mean, I think that it's a, it's a, it is a really, really tough yeah, job. My, my, my hat's um, off to, uh, sure. to our, uh, esteemed brother. And I, and I, you know, um, yeah, I wish him, wish him the best of luck and, uh, excited to see what comes out of the South now. Me too. It'll yeah. be, it'll be, it, it'll be interesting. So the first, the first thing I wanted to talk about, uh, was an essay that was actually just posted on, uh, the what was it the from darkness to light blog right this is one mm-hmm. of the uh, masonic blogs that are out there and uh mm-hmm. the title of the article is i could have watched it on youtube um and it was kind of a a kind of a you know article it um, kind of is but it kind of isn't like it, yeah it, I, I don't know 
we'll, we'll, we'll go, you go ahead. Keep keep yeah, going. Yeah. So I'll, so basically, I'll, I'll jump in later. Basically, what it was is that they, you know they were doing a, a an outdoor one day class. This is a um, this is a guy you know kind of you know describing this thing. He they, they did a one day class. Excuse me, and um, uh, uh, and it was an outdoor degree. And, uh, Mm -hmm. everybody was, uh, on point, like, you know, the, the, the evening was, you know, nice and the, the degree went well and everybody, the costumes were great and everybody, you know, everybody knew their part and it was a kind of basically as, as flawless as you could hope to, to get it. But there were 40 guys getting their third degree and at the end of it, um, and they did one exemplar and they did one exemplar. Um, which kind of makes sense because sure, it's a performance, right? You know, yeah. Sure, and, for, and and forty guys, man, that's a long time. It's a yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot to do, and and so what he what he said is, this guy comes back uh, and he says, um, I'm, only, "I'm trying to see here. What did he? What did he he, he ran into a guy in the parking lot, and one of the one of the candidates or one of the new master masons, and just said, "Hey, how's it going for you?" And that guy said. Eh. He said, I waited a whole year for this. I could have watched this on YouTube. I got nothing out of this. I got an apron, though. So that's something. I get to wear it when I'm dead. That's what my mentor said. <laughs> I mean, talk about, talk about a downer. Know, gut, this is a gut <laughs> right? this is the best. Right? The best part about this, too, is that you know that the author loves him some masonry, right? Like, yeah. And just, it, you know, he flew there to see this. Like, yeah was excited, you know, I've never been to an outdoor degree before, blah, blah, blah. And he gets confronted with the reality, like baseball bat to the chops. <laughs> yeah, this sucked. I could have watched it on YouTube. And here's the thing. He's right. Uh, yeah. I mean, how do we get there? How did, how did, how does something like that happen? Greed. <laughs> greed. You know what it is? It's greed and low self-esteem. That's how you get there. In fact, Wait, low self-esteem on wait, wait, wait. It's where low self-esteem on whose part, though? But on ours, on ours. Yeah, absolutely on ours, right? Our low yeah. self-esteem says we got to, we got to get forty guys. You know, even when we've got a tricked-out, really cool thing that we're doing, we're going to do the third degree under the canopy of heaven, right? Under the right. starry deck sky, super, super cool. Even when you've got that hook, you say, "I got to have forty guys." That's so if there were like game. five, would it have made a difference? Yes, because you'd have been able to give all five of them the actual degree. They would have been able to participate. And that's the key, right? Because that's what the guy was saying. I could have watched this on YouTube. He's not wrong. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that like, you know, and, and people wonder why. And people have asked me like, oh, you know, Scottish right. You know, why do people walk in the front door and out the back? Because they could have watched it on YouTube. You know? You sit in an auditorium with 50 of your friends. You know? There's yeah. nothing. There's, there is literally no substitute for experience. And, and, and going through the degree, being the exemplar, is the experience. That's what you're paying for. Right. Yeah. You know? No, I, 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 would, I would totally agree with that. And I would just add that, that something that is a spectator event, you know, and, and this is, this is certainly true of the Scottish right degrees, right? Um, uh, Something that is a spectator event like that. um, uh, The thing is, is when those kinds of events were first put on, you know, back in the mid 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. was, you know, going to the theater was something that most people never, ever did. So to be in a, a an impressive yeah, room fair. like that, you know, sure, dressed sure. to the nines that's, and that's fair. and being a spectator at something like that would be incredibly meaningful. Just like if you took somebody, you know, out of like, you know, I don't know, like the the Gobi Desert or something like that and flew him to the, you know, to London or something like that and stuck him in a grand theater and showed him Star Wars for the first time. His head would probably fly off, right? It, it would be like a, you know, like wow, this is like never experienced right. something like that. You know, it's a it's a meaningful yeah, sure. thing. But in our culture now, right. where we watch everything, 
and we have so many choices of what to watch, the idea of watching itself, mm -hmm. even when you're watching something important sure. or watching something yeah, yeah. Sure. together, it doesn't have the same kind of impact that, that something like a direct experience, which ironically, it's, it's kind of switched, right? So mm -hmm. years ago, there was this guy, uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who was a technologist at MIT. Yeah. And he, yeah, yeah, sure. he came up with Heard something that was called the Negroponte switch. And basically what he said was everything that once went over cables is going to be wireless. And everything that was once wireless is going to go over cables. And it turned out to be true, right? So if you think about it, like television, we used to broadcast it. Now it's all cable, uh -huh. Fair. right? All right, okay. Yep. And telephones yep. used to be wired and now it's all, mo you know, it's all wireless, right? So it's like, <laughs> right? It's the same kind of thing. It's like the Negroponte switch in masonry, right? So everything yeah, okay. that like, like would have been like really cool, to a to a, 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 you know, like for for a guy on the frontier, like direct interaction with people is probably all they ever had to look forward to. So the idea of a, a big spectacle is mm -hmm. is a big deal. I mean, look at things like Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, right? It, Mm -hmm. It's, you know, uh, there's elephants, there's, there's Indians, there's horses, there's like, it, it's just like, it's over the top because sure. nobody's ever right. experienced that. And they were likely never to experience it again. So make it, you know, make the juice worth the squeeze. And, and, mm -hmm. and so, uh, uh, so it, it it's definitely though a, a really interesting, um, you know, we had a lot of discussions when I was in New York, uh, at the, at the cigar bar event about sort of what, uh, what younger men, uh, millennials are looking for mm -hmm. and that that i think is going to be an important part is this idea of having actual experiences versus watching so for anybody who's in a leadership position who's starting to think oh you know maybe we should just put this on a video and show it and we'll, <laughs> we'll transmit the same information folly without having to put folly. on a big thing right don't go folly. there just don't go there that's exactly right, right. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But I, but it, it's definitely a good. Uh, it's a good, good summer reading, a, right? It is a good, good thing yeah, to read. It's a good read. Good read. All it's right. a good read. Um, okay, so let's get into let's get into books. Let's get into books because yeah, let's get let's books. let's talk about books. Uh, so let's talk like to, about. Like, I like wanna, to read. Yeah. Uh, do you want me good. to go first? Yeah. Yeah. You want me to go first? I'm gonna go yeah. first. I want to go. So we. Um, I'm going to go first. I want to do my, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the clockwork universe. Uh, mine are kind of related now that I think about it. They are. They are. They are. Related. So this There's is a, a this there. is the book, right? Yeah. That's the, the book. Clockwork, clockwork universe. Clockwork universe. We'll, we'll have links Edward, to all this in the show notes. Yeah. Edward Dolnick. Um, let me read you the, I'll read you the synopsis on the back. <clears throat> At the end of the 17th century, sickness was divine punishment. Astronomy and astrology were indistinguishable, and the world's most brilliant, ambitious, and curious scientists were tormented by contradiction. They believed in angels, devils, and alchemy, yet also believed in the universe, that the universe followed a precise mathematical law that, and that was as intricate and perfectly regulated as the me mechanisms of a great clock. The clockwork universe captures these monolithic thinkers as they wrestled with nature's most sweeping mysteries. Uh, and it's really about Leibniz and uh, Newton. Uh, those are the two big thinkers that he's really talking about here. Um, and it is, it, it is a really well-written book. Uh, very, very, very accessible. It's uh, one of the first books um, about this time period, which is the Age of Enlightenment, and really one of the most interesting parts of European history, in my opinion. Um, this is one of the first books I've read that really uh, gets you kind of in, um, in their mindset and mm -hmm. tries to get you to understand what they were dealing with. How, what, what was their day-to-day -day life like? Why are they thinking these thoughts? Um, and it's really interesting. I mean, there's a, the, the description of, um, of, uh, uh, um, come on, Jason, you can do it, uh, of, uh, uh, French palace, Versailles. Uh, the, the, uh, the description of Versailles in this book is epic. <laughs> it's ridiculous because you know I, I was there you've been there right you've yeah. been there you've seen how gorgeous it is i mean and, yeah. it, and it is jaw slacking gorgeous and and when you get into the building it's absolutely beautiful 
The truth of the matter, however, is that in their time, it was disgusting. <laughs> um, and, was, and, and literally, they were walking through their own excrement. Um, and like, <laughs> literally. Yeah, that's, that's painting a very Baroque picture. It, it is. Yeah. It, it's all in here. And, it's, and it is, it's, it's crazy. And how they literally, um, they would actually, they, they, and I've seen them before, they, they would wear bottles of perfume that they would open up and smell because it smelled so bad around oh, yeah. them. Well, that's the origin because of the they, boutonniere, right? Like, you that's know, right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and, <laughs> and that was because they thought that if you didn't have a nice crust of dirt along your pores, that's where disease would get in, into your pores. That's right. So you, you literally bathed yourself only when absolutely necessary. Um, yeah. Yeah. They were fine times. So, like... You know, these guys were kind of were, were in that era um, and, and, and doing incredible science on top of that. Very, very cool book. So highly, highly recommend. And it's really where you get the seeds of Freemasonry from. Interesting. So, my, you know, one of my picks kind of dovetails into one of your picks. Well, right. Dovetail away. Uh, which is uh, so I would re- I would recommend you read the book that I'm about to recommend first and then read a clockwork universe because of the time period. Right. And so this book is by William Manchester. It's called a world that only by fire. Uh, It's a, it's a short read. So the story goes that, you know, William Manchester is uh, a, was, was a, uh, the sort of wrote the, uh, the, probably the best biography of Churchill. It's a three volume. Uh, uh, yeah. Book, okay. Right. Sure. Called sure. The, the, the last lion. Mm-hmm. And um, he got cancer in between the second and third book. And he wound up actually not th- finishing the third volume. Someone else, like one of his, one mm-hmm. of his graduate students, I think finished it for him. Um, okay. But, you know, while he was undergoing chemotherapy, he thought, well, I need a distraction. So he wrote this book. Uh, just to kind of keep himself occupied. And it's a it's a short but really, really good read. And really what it talks about is sort of is sort of the, the point at which the medieval mind turned into the Renaissance mind. And oh, what were terrific. those what were those shifts in thinking? You know, terrific. and it and it kind of it kind of, I think, deals in the similar, uh, you know, similar themes. Right. Like, yeah, sure. You know, just this idea that like at the beginning, uh, you know, before the Enlightenment. Um, right. You know, or before the Renaissance, you know, people like their their whole day was governed by God and, you know, by the idea of God. And <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, here, let me I'll, I'll read you this. This is this is 100 percent right up the alley, although this is this is about a 100 or 200 years after what you're talking about. But <clears throat> he says uh, in the 1650s and 60s, the long simmering fear of God's wrath grew acute. Every Christian knew his Bible, and everyone knew that the Bible talked of the Day of Judgment. The question was not whether the world would end, but how soon the world would come to an end. Yeah. The answer, it seemed, was very soon. <laughs> um, no, this, is the, this is the crazy part. Almost no one believed in the idea of progress. Think that, think that sentence yeah. through. yeah. The very scientists whose discoveries would create the modern world did not believe it. Think about that. Yeah. That's mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Um, on the contrary, the nearly universal belief that the world had been falling apart since Adam and Eve were banished from Eden. <laughs> now it seemed the fall had accelerated. From high and low, in learned sermons, shrieking pamphlets, men pointed out the signs of the apocalypse was near. Yeah. And, and that didn't change for hundreds of years. It, well, it, we're, it, in some ways, it's still with us today, right? Sure, I mean, absolutely. We're still, we're still like, yeah. you know. Absolutely, absolutely. It, like, you just turn the news on, and it's like, mm-hmm. it, the world's going to end tomorrow. Like, well, you yep. know, is this it? It's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, and what's interesting, too, is like at, around that time period. So there was this guy, Baruch Spinoza, who uh-huh, wrote, uh-huh. who wrote, sure, Spinoza. Uh, yeah, well, Spinoza, like what was interesting about Spinoza is up until Spinoza, we had no idea of like the individual as, you know, like this idea that that, that right. we're individuals and we have rights. 
right? right. That just didn't exist up what? until like you know 1640. Yeah. Like like yeah, the, uh, just it just didn't pop in anybody's head. And and even after and even after Spinoza, hardly everyone anyone knew who Spinoza was, nor his writings. Right. You right. know. Yeah. They didn't discover Spinoza until until much later in the, the late 1600s did he start to get really circulated around by basically what by were... By guys like Descartes. And, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and basically what turned out to be John Locke, um, yeah. uh, those kind of people who, who ended up being revolutionaries. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. That, see, that's fascinating. See, this is yeah. good stuff. This gets, so all yeah. you, so we got two books. You're right, though. Read Eric's first because it sets up where they're going and it's really important to know where you're go- coming from to where you're going <laughs> yeah and and it's funny you say that because the 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 the, the thread that ties uh, a world that only by fire together is sort of the voyages of magellan because up oh, until then cool. just the conception of the world was totally different right. right and once magellan made that circumnambulation around the world right it it mm-hmm. it broaden people's understanding of what the world actually was and sure. how large it was. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it, I, I find that, you know, like this idea of like knowing where you are and knowing where you're going. Right. Yeah. That sure. was, that was figured out, you know, absolutely at that point. Right. Yeah. This gets into um, Isaac Newton. This, this, the big theme in this one is the Royal society and the founding members of the Royal society mm-hmm. and about how important they were. Um, to establishing what we now know as the scientific method. Uh, and it's ter- terrific, terrific stuff. So, all right. Okay. Cool. Uh, next book. I'm up. What's your next book? Am I up? Yeah. Let's go, let's, go, uh, let's go with the John D. biography. Okay. That is uh, so related to the Clockwork Universe about the, about, around about the same time. Uh, so this book is The Queen's Conjurer by Benjamin Woodley. Uh, and it is a biography of Dr. John D. Um, those with an esoteric bent will very much know who Dr. D is. Um, <clears throat> but uh, for those of you who don't, John D. was um, he was a learned man um, when that was uh, a burning offense. Unusual, yeah, <laughs> when it was an unusual thing. <laughs> Um, and he, he, he actually lived in a very precarious time. He was, he was living uh, in London during the time where London wasn't really sure if it wanted to be Catholic or Protestant. And so uh, a succession of uh, sovereigns came through that went, oh, we're definitely Catholic, let's burn all the Protestants. And then a few years later, you'd get a new one and they'd go, but nope, we're definitely Protestants, let's burn all the Catholics. And so, uh, and they would play that game a few times um, before they hit uh, Queen Elizabeth, who converted um, to the Church of England, and that was it. And then it was done. He ends up um, basically uh, surviving <laughs> uh, these these kind of binges and purges um, as not just a uh, like a, a Catholic theologian, but as a Protestant theologian as well. Like he 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 does well for himself. Um, the book strongly um, considers that that D was a spy, um, and in fact was the spy master uh, in England, um, and that uh, he was a, a, a huge collector of um, esoteric texts. Um, but a lot of those texts, um, uh, while on their surface were about magic, uh, it turns out were actually code books, um, and that that people have broken them. Um, there are a couple books that actually really rare books that, that uh, he sought in his lifetime um, that were written by a monk um, and they purported to give instant communication over long distances. Uh, that was the magic. And it was uh, the books were written such uh, that, that, that it showed you what uh, angels slash demons you needed to conjure and then how you gave them the message. And then uh, they would go, they would pop into you know heaven or hell or the ether or whatever and then instantaneously communicate it to someone else well that was all so were the, were they ange- were, so were the angels uh code names was it like uh no 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 so so it turns out like and it was ridiculously hard to read but it turns out that it was it was it was actually a cipher and when you got into the cipher it was just examples of hey if you want to say you know 
you know, the, the king of Spain has troops on, you know, the good road, you know, here's how you would go to it. Uh, and then you put it into this and you, you know, here's a good place for a dead drop outside London. It, it really, it was, it was incredible stuff. Um, now, later in his life, he became a conjurer uh, for the queen. Uh, and he's famous for what's called Enochian magic, um, which purports to be uh, magic used by the archangels. Um, and that's really interesting in and itself. And so he becomes almost like a Rasputin type character. Um, he he so, kind of looks. He kind of looks like a Rasputin type character. I mean, yeah. You know, oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, he's absolutely. The, he's definitely got the beard. You know. Absolutely. You know. And and during his lifetime, he had one of the largest public like or largest private libraries um, in London, and lost it all twice. You know. I mean, like he's a he's a really really interesting guy. Um, so, so does the book. Uh, very does cool the book, book. Me- so does the book mention? anything about i mean did he believe any of this stuff or was it do you think that <laughs> so he that's was... the question right is what is what is the truth about d was d a spy was d uh, a magician a real magician did he figure something out because enochian magic is really weird uh and really interesting and so was he you know like w- w- nobody really knows there's very little known about him. There was very little written and left over from him. I mean, he was probably a spy master, so that goes to figure that he'd leave a pretty small footprint. Yeah. Um, but the little that is left of him is really strange and really cool, and it shows an, uh, what an incredibly smart man he was. Um, and, I mean, he would have been a giant intellect of his time. So... Really cool book. Highly recommend it. It's a it's a great read. Uh, it can be a little dry. It is a it is a straight up biography, and um, but it's but it's still great because he's really interesting. Cool. So there you so go. So my uh, and this is this is not just not this is not just great summer reading, mm-hmm. but it is probably the best book that I've read this year. Ooh, and um, that's, that's big. That's big can... talkings. It is, isn't it? And it is it is this book, <laughs> Jewish Pirates That's of the so Caribbean. <laughs> That's so awesome, <laughs> right? I think I might might have sure. mentioned this uh, on yeah. the show just in passing, but yeah. but, but this is that. an amazing book. And first you of all, don't anybody who don't anybody ha- uses uses the phrase swashbuckling Jews exactly I'm in exactly in. like how do you how, how, amazing that, it and it's it's so funny when I when I found this book, it just popped up in my Kindle recommendations. And I just thought to myself, just based on the title alone, it reminded me of that scene in Airplane where she's passing out magazines and he says, I, I just want something, you know, short. And he, she says, well, here's this pamphlet on great Jewish sports heroes, you know, and it's like a tiny, 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 like little, you know, yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I thought, I thought to myself, I'm in, right. I'm in. Yeah. Right. That's and so, terrific. but the story, first of all, I have to, I have to say, uh, uh, Kritzler, who who wrote this book, um, sure. It, it, this is one of those books. Like the first thing I always look at is like, is this thing like documented? Like, is he using sources? Are they real sources? Is he, ju- you know, is this Absolutely. is this like right. a Robert Lomas, you know, John sure. Robinson right. uh-huh. Templars? We want to make blah, you blah, blah, blah. It's right. a good story. I want right. to make you feel good about this, but this right. isn't real. Yeah. yeah, and and it's it's actually. It's actually, you know, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I can't really, I can't really, you know, mm-hmm. evaluate each one of his sources, but it is, it is heavily footnoted and, and, and sourced. Mm-hmm. So that was a, that was a really great thing. So the thing about this is that it presents, it, it, it's really kind of a study in sort of how we read history, right? Mm-hmm. Because it, so it, it turns out that you know, that according to this book, that the reason that there were pirates of the Caribbean were because of the Jews. And I'll give you the, I'll give you the map. I'll give you the, like how this, how this comes about, right? It this starts sounds, this. It sounds like the conclusion of a crazy conspiracy theory. It does. And it is. Why were there, why were there pirates? The Jews. The Jews, right? Yeah, right. exactly. Okay, right. Okay. And why were there Jews in the Caribbean, right? Because Sugar of tree. Columbus. Columbus. Okay. All right. So okay. it turns out that there's this whole alternative, uh, uh, 
there's there, there's there's kind of a branch of history that's that's looking again at Columbus because there's a lot of things about Columbus that just never added up, right? One sure. was okay. that if this guy came from Genoa, why did he speak absolutely no Italian? <laughs> right? Fair. He never wrote anything in Italian except for one poem that he copied. Okay. That he was that he sent to a to to a a girl to try to impress her, so it's kind of like, okay. it's like that that didn't add up. The other thing that didn't add up is okay. if he was just like some navigator from Genoa, how did he mm-hmm. get into the Spanish court? Hmm. Right. Fair. It, yeah. Fair. Okay. Right. All right. So yeah, yeah. it turns out that that the the best theory and and this is um uh, this is according to a, a a documentary that I've I've seen. Um, mm-hmm. And historians in, in, in Portugal have been doing a lot of work on this, is that he was actually the son of a Portuguese nobleman and a Jewish mm-hmm. mother. Oh. And a Jewish mother. Right. And he was a bastard son. Um, but the fact that he was, yeah, the fact that he was a bastard meant that he could, he still had the connections he could kind of move in those circles. Now, at the time, you know, 1492 is just after... Spain has has basically kicked all the Moors out of out of Spain, right? So uh-huh. the rest yep. of the you know the the, the what little Muslim uh, uh, rule was there is now gone, right? And at that time, the only people who really knew how to navigate, right, were mm-hmm. the Arabs and the Jews, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because the Jews worked for the Arabs essentially, and so and right. so uh, when you look at the 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 people who were so so let's back up for a second. So in 1492 there's this there's this uh you know 1492 is 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 generally observed by the Jewish people as a great tragedy because that was the year that the Jews were expelled from Spain. Okay. And it was a huge thing because there were you know the the um the the Jewish uh presence in Spain in Andalusia in the middle ages was considered like a Jewish golden age. And this is where like, you know, the, the commentaries of Rashi and a lot of the Kabbalistic texts are, mm-hmm. are promulgated and things like that. Right. And so um, this, this, you know, and they, and they enjoyed relative freedom and, and there was a lot of scholarship, but, but this all changed in 1492. And in fact, it's curious and not altogether an accident that the day that, that uh, Columbus left on his voyage mm-hmm. was the day, the deadline that Jews had to either convert or get out on pain of death. <laughs> and so a lot of them converted and they were called mm-hmm. Nuevo Cristianos, right? Which right. new Christians. Uh-huh. Sure. Yep. And in private, they were called Marranos, which is pigs, because mm-hmm. it was believed that they were still practicing their Judaism. And so even after they converted, and many of them did, uh, you know, honestly convert. Right. Some of them, converted and still secretly practiced Judaism or had, you know, mm-hmm. and so, um, uh, so basically what Columbus did was he took a lot of these conversos who were not getting a fair shake and they were like, you know what, let's just go, let's go somewhere. Let's go do something. They got on the, on the <laughs> ships. So a lot of the guys, that, right. So yeah. a lot of the guys that went with Columbus were converted Jews. Three, right. Funny. I've got these three ships. What do you yeah. Think? Yeah. Let's, 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 you know, let's, let's avoid it. Let's, let's, let's get out of the country for a little while and figure shit out. Right. So, right. Absolutely. Who yeah. wants to circumnavigate? Yeah. So, so what happens is they go and they, and they, you know, essentially discover America mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they get back and Columbus makes a couple more voyages. And one of the things that he does is he cuts a deal with the King of Spain that the Island of Jamaica will be owned by the Columbus family in perpetuity. And the king didn't initially want to grant it, but he wound up doing it because the only person who knew how to get to the new world was Columbus. Right. <laughs> right. At that time. Okay. Yeah, and, sure. and so, uh, so he agreed to it because he had had one of his spies tell him that there's really nothing in Jamaica. Jamaica had no natural resources. There was no gold. There was no nothing, you know, nothing that mm-hmm. they wanted. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Just a bunch of land and wild cows in the North of the Island. Now that's important because mm-hmm come back to it later. So, uh, so, um, Columbus, one of the things about Columbus is because he was, he was Jewish essentially because his mother was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Jamaica became this haven for Jews trying to escape the inquisition. 
And so when Spain went and discovered, you know, when so a lot of these a lot of these conversas were like, hey, we can't make any money here because we're discriminated against, even though that we've converted to Christianity. We'll make our fortune in the new world. And so a lot of them took their money. They financed these voyages. They were the guys who financed Cortez. They went right. over to America. Right. They found the gold. They extracted the gold. But mm-hmm. whereas the, the, the Spanish, the traditional Spanish traders, because of the charter with Spain, could only trade with Spain at fixed rates. <laughs> the Jews had connections. Because right. Jews All have over. connections, right? The right. Jews had connections to places like the Barbary Coast, mm-hmm. right? Home of the mm-hmm. Barbary pirates. And they were able to t- trade gold as far away as India and mm-hmm. make a lot more profit. And so the Spanish were, the Spanish traders got, you know, they were kind of ticked off at the, at these Chico Jewish figure. traders, right? Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. so they were like, well, we got to get rid of them. So, they went to the church and they, they went to the Holy Office of the Inquisition. They said, you know, there's a bunch of supposed Christians out there in Brazil and they're and they're actually practicing Judaism in secret. And the, and the, you right. know, the Inquisition were like, you know, Cardinal Burn Jimenez, them. Cardinal Fang, mm-hmm. let's go. You mm-hmm. know, and, and you know, Fang. no one, right? No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. They're certainly not going to expect it in Brazil. That's so they right. go to Brazil mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. and they uh, and, and they start. You know, they start rounding up uh, uh, the conversos down there. And so Mm -hmm. um, the conversos left Brazil, went to Peru. And guess what they found there? Silver. Lots and lots of silver. So they just kept getting richer. And (laughs) as the Inquisition is like tracking them Mm -hmm. all over South America, you know, and Mm -hmm. and actually it's it's not a it's not a rosy story for the Jews because the Jews were one of the first to get into the slave trade. Sure. So. So they were. Well, you need you need labor to get all that well, silver it, out of the ground. It, it, but it wasn't about that. It was just about they had they had the you know like they would have gold. Oh, on the, right, they would right, go sure. to Africa. They trade it for slaves. Mm-hmm. And they'd be like, okay, slaves, sure, you know. And, the, and it was a, it was mm-hmm. a commodity at the time. And, and unfortunately, Fair. you know, it's like one of those things that like we go, yeah, well, not so good for us. But anyway, yeah. So so this is this is all going on. And meanwhile, in in Jamaica. Uh, more and more of these rich conversos are mm-hmm. coming into Jamaica because they know that the Inquisition is not welcome there. And so the the Spanish in South America is complaining to the church and the Holy Inquisition is complaining to the King of Spain. And they're saying, you got to you got to tear up this charter granting them asylum because they're getting asylum there. Mm-hmm. And the king's like, well, you know, my hands are tied because I signed a contract, you know, or my my you know, my grandfather, so, you know, now it's like 200 years later, you know, mm-hmm. my great grandfather right. signed a contract. It's pretty airtight. So they right. couldn't, they couldn't take back the island. So the, the Spanish, um, financed a, um, they wanted to finance an invasion. Now the problem was, is that there was a pretty well-armed group of guys on the Northern side of Jamaica that were hunting these wild cows and they would, they would, you know, they would hunt down a cow and they would, they would barbecue it on a green wood grill. And that green wood grill was called a boucan. Mm-hmm. And they were known as the boucaniers, which is where we get the term buccaneer. Okay. Right? right? And so what they did was, instead of going after these guys, what they did was they went after the cows. And mm-hmm. so they, they slaughtered, they completely wiped it. They did what, the, what we did with the buffalo in, in the, in the yep. West, right? They slaughtered all the cows, mm-hmm. removed their mm-hmm. livelihood. And so mm-hmm. the, the, the buccaneers were like, well, geez, you know, we've been hunting. All, uh, hunting is all we know. And now what are we going to hunt, right? People. Well, what, what, is, what does Jamaica have to hunt? Ships. Yes, they so do. So they became, they became pirates. Mm-hmm. Buccaneers. Buccaneers. And so these these sort of rich Jews, they were able to kind of fend off Spain by by essentially creating this class of buccaneers and privateers that would that would go out and hunt down Spanish ships. Okay, and, that's awesome. And now now it's about 1648 or in the 1640s mm-hmm. and Cromwell is now ruling England and mm-hmm. Cromwell wants to get the Jews back because they you know mm-hmm. the Jews had been already been expelled in 1290. And mm-hmm. the economy of of of, uh, of England. England wasn't doing so great because they had nobody to yep. borrow from. The Correct. Catholics wouldn't bar- wouldn't lend them any money. Mm-hmm. The Dutch they were pretty much tapped out through the Dutch, um, and mm-hmm. they were competing with the Dutch anyway uh, on the on the high uh, well, seas. 
And w- weren't uh, weren't most of the Dutch traders Jews anyway? A, a lot of them were, right? But, but yeah. they had already kind of maxed out. So okay. th- again, the 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 by this time the 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 Spanish king had had I think it was Juan Carlos had had uh, had completely been like, you know what? Uh, we're a new dynasty. We're a new family. We're not recognizing any of these charters. We're tearing them all up. And so now mm-hmm. the island of Jamaica was in jeopardy of being invaded by the Spanish. And indeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a um, there was a plot to you know render an invasion, and of course the the you know one of the one of the guys in the court of the king was actually you know uh, descended from conversos and was like, right. I better warn them, and did, <laughs> and so the the Jews, the converso Jews on the island of Jamaica, went to Cromwell and said, you know. 30 or 40 ships you guys could have jamaica for a song and that's how the english got there right wow so and they invited they invited the pirates to actually sure. stay in port royal to protect mm-hmm. the island from from invasion from mm-hmm. spain so mm-hmm. it's a it's an incredibly interesting story and what's interesting too is that like you know you might say well you know the conversos and and you know it sounds crazy but there are communities in Mexico and in Southwest United States that are Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. indigenous people who have Jewish traditions because they were, they're called crypto Jews. Mm -hmm. These are people who were once Jewish. They've, you know, since become Catholic, Mm -hmm. they don't know why they light candles on Friday night. It's just because we've always done it. It's it's a family tradition. Right. Uh And so they have certain practices that are, that are Jewish in nature. But so, so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of evidence that sort of corroborates this, but when you like look at the story in its entirety, you're just like, "What the f?" You know, like it's it it and so it's a it's a great read. And then they talk about like a lot of the pirates. Like I guess Blackbeard's navigator was Jewish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was an actual rabbi pirate. I mean, how does that work, <laughs> right? A yeah, rabbi pirate, exactly. you know. Uh-huh. Um, but but this yeah, is, so this is yeah, this is my this is my captain, Captain Abramovitz. Yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So it's Loves it's, the it's, cannons. An, it's an amazing book. It's great summer reading because it's just it it you know it, you fly through the pages. Yeah, that's um, awesome. You you totally don't have to be Jewish to like to like. No, I think it's super story. cool. That's a great yeah. story. That's it's that's a, terrific. It's amazing. It's an amazing mm-hmm. amazing book. So that's my pick. Yeah, that's, that's what's a your, damn what's your fine next? one. Uh, all right, so so uh, last one here for me. I'm just going to give you this one is uh, my flawless book here. Flawless. Flawless. Okay, so this is. Uh, I'm trying to get it. Right yeah, I don't think here. I have a graphic for that one. No, I don't think you do. <clears throat> so this uh, this book um, this is actually written by a guy uh, named uh, two guys uh, Scott Andrew Selby and Greg Campbell. Um, it's a really good book. This book came from um, a, a, an original reported sh- uh, uh, story by a guy named Josh Davis. Um, Josh Davis is an editor at large and writer for Wired magazine. And uh, Josh Davis reported this story soon after it actually happened uh, in Wired. And it is called... Oh... Uh, Darn it if I can't remember. It is called... Uh, rats, I'll have to find it later. While you're looking that up, uh, Brett Simon, just uh, about 10 minutes ago in, in my in my uh, my Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean rave, said, uh, I need to read up on this Columbus fellow. I feel like what I learned was a lie. Columbus Day is celebrating a guy who never wrote an Italian that's the ironic thing about this whole day, right? right. The entire thing yeah. is, a, it's like, first of all, Columbus Day was like a fictional thing anyway that was just made to make Italian-Americans feel good. Like, I think they should it's just so completely true. do away, you know. So true. There's so many problems now with Columbus Day. They should just they should just trash it and start over and have like Marconi Day, you know? <laughs> that's great. That is that is terrific. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this the original, uh, the original, this story was originally reported uh, in, let's see, it's in Wired Magazine in March of uh, 2009. March 12th, 2009. Um, title of the article is The Untold Story of the World's Biggest Diamond Heist. Um, 
And uh, essentially what happened here um, is that this is the story of act, what is actually the world's largest diamond heist and, and quite possibly the largest single robbery in the world um, to date. And essentially what happened was a group of very, very professional Italian thieves um, broke into um, an ultra-secure diamond facility in the center of Antwerp and robbed it blind over the course of an entire day. It, it gets crazier from there. <clears throat> um, these guys were... Uh, professional thieves the ilk of which are like in a michael mann film um they they are career professionals they're not cowboys waving guns or anything like that they are incredibly sophisticated um the 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 ringleader as far as they can tell is a guy named leonardo uh narbartolo um and i hope i'm pronouncing that right but i probably am murdering it uh, note, no, it's note, note, Notar Bartolo, Notar Bartolo, and <clears throat> they're from, uh, and he and all his associates are from um, uh, a, a small town uh, in northern Italy, and um, it called Turin, famous for the Shroud of Turin. Right. Um, but Turin, it turns out, is also famous for ridiculously specialized thieves. As it um, turns out. Oh, I see. <laughs> As it there. turns I out, see. yeah. So <clears throat> um, these these incredible thieves uh, that come from Turin, and uh, it's a group of what they think are about five or six guys who are incredible engineers <laughs> um, and con men. Basically, get themselves. They find a perfect day to in Antwerp. It's a, they did an exhibition tennis match. Um, that uh, was headlined by Serena Williams. And literally, they had picked that day because they knew that almost everybody in Antwerp was going to be at this huge event because Serena Williams was going to be there. And, um, <clears throat> and, and the city had, had really pushed it as this big event. And so they picked that day. And then they, they figured they had about 12 to 14 hours inside this vault once they got in, which was supposed to be an unbreakable vault with a key that was 25 inches long. That's one key, just one. It also had a, I think, 14-digit combination. It also had an, a, a, a buzzer alarm that you can't get around. It, no matter what happened when you open the door, it always buzzed. That's the point so that someone looked at it and they defeated everything they defeated the uh, temperature sensors inside the vault they defeated the motion sensors inside the vault they defeated countless countless things the fact that you literally can't walk in um in antwerp without being caught on camera almost every square foot of antwerp has closed circuit television on it because there's so many diamonds <laughs> in in there uh, they literally mapped out the blind spots of the entire city and were able to maneuver themselves around the entire city that day so that they were never on camera. <laughs> it's, it is an incredible book. Uh, and the ingenuity is, is just it's amazing. And then it also has a really cool backstory about what the real diamond trade is like. Um, and how the real diamond trade is a very gray market. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's good diamonds, there's bad diamonds, but they're all just diamonds. <laughs> um, and, and so what they're, they're really, it's all a barter system. There is no such thing as real diamond pricing. It's what one guy will pay another guy. And it's yeah, all done totally. for the most part, especially in Antwerp, it's all done on a handshake. Um, a lot of times they don't even write anything down. Um, a lot of time, a lot of these diamond brokers and dealers will have all of their accounts in their head. Yeah. Um, part of that is for security, but part of that is just that's how the business has been done for centuries. Um, yeah, actually, so, I have, I have a close friend of mine is is uh, is a diamond broker, and mm -hmm. the way that they store them um, is that little, they're they're wrapped in packets. little pieces of paper, yep. with pencil that just says here's what the diamond is. 
right? And that's it. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and, yeah. and you can have, in fact, a uh, funny sure. story. Yeah. So when I was getting engaged to my lovely wife, uh, we went to see her, my friend, and yeah. uh, they decided they were going to play a, a joke on me. And so she picked out one of the most expensive items in the collection, which was like a, it was like a 12 carat, you know, monster, you know, <laughs> diamond, right? Sure. Uh-huh. Uh, it was, it was not entirely flawless, but it was pretty, you know, it was a great color and pretty good clarity. Sure. And th- the way that diamonds are priced is they're priced per carat, right? Mm-hmm. So you might, you might you know, like a, a really l- large diamond will have a high price per carat. And then it's how many mm-hmm. carats it weighs times mm-hmm. that multiplier. So it might be, you know, uh, $2,000 a carat. And then if it's, you know, 12 carats. Yep. Uh-huh. Right? Yeah. And so she says, you know, here's, here's the, she says, here, honey, here's the diamond that I want. And I, I open this thing up and it's, first of all, it's like, it's way too big to be like in a ring. I mean, this is something you'd have right. as like a, yeah. you know, right. as a neck piece or something. Right. It right. was humongous. Installed, installed in your installed forehead. Installed in, in the idol. Yeah. yeah in, the, in, the, in the head yeah. of the idol. Sure. It, it, and, and so I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking to myself, this is just too big for a ring, but I'm like, it's my <clears throat> wife to be, you know, and I look at the paper and I, it was, it was $23,000. And I just like it. I didn't see it. I knocked off a number. I knocked off a zero. And so I was reading $2,300 and I think I'm thinking it's a little more than I wanted to spend, but if it'll make you well, happy and they're just, they're looking at me like, are you mental? <laughs> you know, that's terrific. But yeah, they're that all, is... they're all stored in like, in like file boxes, yeah, yeah. In, you know, in a safe. Yeah. And, um, it's interesting if you go to New York, they'll, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. a lot of those guys are armed to the teeth right. when they walk around town, but kind, in Chicago, kind of in most most places in the world they're not and the reason so is Antwerp, because a yeah. a it, it calls attention to itself but b they're like and i asked one of them i said well how come you guys don't like walk around like armed to the teeth they're like that's what insurance is for mm-hmm. yeah that's number one and so uh in antwerp uh, they don't but the reason is is that they don't walk around armed to the teeth either um because they're so confident in their security which unfortunately <laughs> is why this book exists. It, it, it is a terrific story. Um, if you read The Wired, uh, The Wired is a much shorter version uh, of, the, of the full story. Um, it is, oh, it's fascinating. The, the, the Wired article is really well written as well, um, but it's one of my favorite heist stories of all times. Um, not, a, not a gunshot fired, not a drop of blood. This is all just brains. Yeah, massive I, I of love brains. I love stories of, of heists like that. You know, just <gasps> like it's the so planning great. and the execute and the people involved, and the and uh, the people involved in this one are just fascinating. They've got great names like uh, the King of Keys <laughs> is one, um, and this guy's this guy's specialty is keys, right? And he's called the King of Keys in I turn key because because the legend is about him, and what they say in this book is that it is true. He can literally cut keys by sight. So if you show yeah. him a key, no problem, I can make that. All he there's has to a, do is look at it once, and it's boom, I can make that. There's a YouTube video that I, about a month or two ago I came across solely by accident, and it's basically this guy who's like a – he breaks into places for a living, like he's a security yeah. consultant. so great. And – the whole video, it's like an hour long video of like all the ways you can defeat locks that have nothing to do with picking the lock. He's like, who has time to pick a lock? And they're just these uh, ingenious ways yeah. to defeat uh-huh. like, yeah, like yeah. most like what he what he said is like most deadbolts are installed incorrectly. Mm-hmm. The, okay. uh, what's what's also really interesting is that uh, um, and, and this they kind of get into this uh, in this book, actually. But uh, I, I know this for a fact from some uh, friends out here that work for three letter agencies. Um, that um, uh, locks for the federal government, especially locks that lock away actual secrets, real big deal secrets, are actually rated on a time scale. Yeah. Uh, and, they're, and they're rated by a time scale because they know that every lock is defeatable. Yeah. It's just an estimate at how long it should take someone to break it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just depressing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just depressing. Um, but, but, but very true. So highly recommend this is a super fun book. Uh, and, and it's, and it's 
the, 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 again, the characters are great. The the King of there's, Peace there's another a guy heist. called the Giant. They've each got cool names, and that's yeah, of course they have to have cool cool name guys. Yeah. Um, there there was a, a story a few years back. I, I'm a bit of a watch aficionado, and um, the most expensive watch ever made was a, a watch called the Marie Antoinette that was mm-hmm. created by uh, Louis Breguet That he started when uh, Marie Anto- it was it was originally going to be for Marie Antoinette. Mm-hmm. It was started the year she was the the of the coronation, mm-hmm. and he finished it, I think, like two years after she died. Um, and right. it, it has like every possible complication, you know, like right. stop. Right. I mean, it, it had yeah. a GPS yeah. before there was GPS. It had every, you know, like, you know, heart rate monitor. Yeah. It had all of it. Right. right? And, it's, and it's beautiful. Sure. Yeah. And it was it was kind of like, you know, it's kind of maybe this, you know, the maybe the diameter of a baseball. You know, it's like it was mm-hmm. just this big sure. hunk of. It's got to be giant. Yeah. Yeah. And. um and it was owned by uh, Nicholas Hayek, who is the he was the owner of the ETA group, which makes most of the at the time made most of the Swiss movements in Switzerland. Sure. And okay, owns okay. Swatch like the Swatch group yeah, now owns okay. it. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. the Swatch group owns like like really like cool brands like Blancpain and right. uh, uh, Berger uh, and uh uh, Patek Philippe. Or they don't. Philippe. They don't own Patek. No. They don't. There's like no, still a couple right. of a, a bunch of independents, but but uh, Omega, they own okay. them. Sure. Um, they okay. also Tissot. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. there's a, a whole bunch of brands like from all the way down at the Swatch at the bottom to sure, you know, Breguet at the top um, mm-hmm. uh, that they own, and he owned this this watch, and he had donated it. He had given it uh, on loan to to a museum in Israel, mm-hmm. and. People had um, uh, some some thieves had like gone through the roof oh, and so stole the watch, and awesome. Hayek was completely despondent. And so, uh, but he immediately said, "You know what? We're going to build another one because he had Bruges papers and stuff, and right. nothing like this had ever been attempted." And so, after twelve years, he finally unveiled the new Marie Antoinette. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the thieves returned the Marie Antoinette because they could not. <laughs> they couldn't sell it. They couldn't, they couldn't sell it. it. They couldn't do anything with it, right? So I guess That's you know. So and, great. and it's like if you if you were the guy who you know if you were the the Japanese businessman or the Russian oligarch or whatever that that commissioned this this theft, right? Who are you going to show? You can't show it to anybody, right? You can just terrific. You, you go into that's your terrific. bathroom and you're like, that is a fine looking watch, you know, and that's all you can do. Well, so eventually, you know, and, 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 and that's what they said about when uh, when the uh, Mona Lisa was stolen, <clears throat> they, you know, they ended up finding it in the thief's apartment and precisely that. Who are you going to take it to? Who's going right. to buy it? Who's going to say <laughs> you're going to go, hey, want this? Hell no. Yeah. <laughs> Get it's that a really good me. fake. <laughs> Right. right. No. <laughs> no. So yeah, yeah, exactly. I, so wait, I gotta, I gotta read you this. So this is from the, uh, this is from the intro paragraph uh, from, from the, uh, the original uh, Diamond Heist. This is so impressive. In February two thousand three, uh, Nota Bartolo was arrested for heading a, a ring of Italian thieves. They were accused of breaking into a vault two floors beneath the Antwerp Diamond Center making off with at least $100 million worth of loose diamonds, gold, jewelry, and other spoils. The vault was thought to be impenetrable. It was protected by 10 layers of security, including infrared heat detectors, Doppler radar, a magnetic field, a seismic sensor, and a lock with 100 million possible combinations. The, the robbery was called the heist of the century, and even now the police can't explain exactly how it was done. <laughs> So uh, a- Alan uh, Asami was asking, what, what's the name of the book again? Uh, Flawless, Inside the Largest Diamond Heist in History by a Scott Andrew Selby and Greg Campbell. And then the original, um, the original Wired article is called uh, The Untold Story of the World's Biggest Diamond Heist. I'll, I'll get Eric the, uh, the link and we'll put it on the show notes. Yeah. So the last book in our in our summer reading uh, is is uh, actually kind of a, a Masonic book. Uh, mm-hmm. It is called The Masonic Magician, The Life and Death of Count Cagliostro and His Egyptian Rite. Um, I started by, reading that. Yeah, by uh, uh, Philippa Fox and uh, Robert L.D. Cooper. Is that a, is that the Robert Cooper of yeah. uh-huh. the Grand Lodge of Scotland? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I think so. I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, if, if it's the same Bob Cooper, uh, Bob Cooper is the grand librarian of the grand Lodge of Scotland and an amazing guy and definitely a guy. If you ever have the opportunity to go have a single malt with him, uh, he, he is, he is the it one, is. he's one of the few people who can, uh, who will judge you based on your choice of single malt. <laughs> he will and size you so. up by what you order. And, and, rightly, and so. rightly so. Rightly so. Um, but, but this book is, is it, this book is really about, um, just, it's sort of a biography of Cagliostro and I, I didn't know very much about him before. I mean, I knew he mm-hmm. was sort of a celebrated guy in Europe, but, but it really talks about like the fascination that, that people in the upper classes had with freemasonry and what it offered you know just beyond sort of Mm -hmm. the the normal like i mean put it this way there was no like well we take good men and make them better you know or to be one (laughs) ask what right it wasn't like that at all right they had no bumper stickers right yeah he was offering like uh very uh very Mm -hmm. uh you know detailed secret knowledge and stuff like that and so he was the one who kind of came up with the uh you know the the Egyptian right, which is uh, Memphis Mizraim, right, right, um, and and uh, and it's kind of an interesting thing. So he, you know, he, the, the his 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 bona fides as a count are you know pretty much made up. Um, sure. You know, he he came from a pretty humble background and and was a you know a bit of a social climber and used masonry as a way to get into the salons and the and the uh, the courts of Europe, uh, to kind of, to kind of peddle his, his, uh, his degree system. And at first it was, it was sort of legit and on the up and up, but after, after a time, you know, uh, Cagliostro came on hard times and started uh, not quite selling his degrees, but kind of selling his degrees. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons I think that, that, you know, by the time, you know, by the, by the probably the turn of the of the 20th century uh masonry as a whole had been completely fed up with memphis miserum and that's why it's kind of on the verboten right. list in terms of a degree system sure right. so it's a it's a really interesting book uh just to kind mm-hmm. of get inside the head of of this guy who is and such it's an really well people. written too yeah it's really well written too yeah. um really fun and if and if bob cooper's associated with it you can be assured that it's well researched right like he yep. mm-hmm. He, you know, he's he's one of the big proponents of of the whole like uh, Rosalind Chapel, uh, yep. Sinclair yep. Templar Masonic mm-hmm. connection. He's he's like it's a bunch of I won't Hooey. use the word he used, but <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> now, now without some Hooey. more scotch, <laughs> hooey. Yeah, hooey. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But yeah, good, good, good All book. Right. Yeah, yeah. All so, right, good. I hey, you've got books now. Go read them. Go read. Yeah. Go go sit on a beach. Yeah. Uh, get your get yourself a little uh, little uh, Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Get a little get, get a mad dog spritzer. spritzer. A, ma- yeah. a spritzer. A mad dog spritzer, and you know. Here's my thing: the pirates would have loved the spritzer, but the pirates would have loved it because the thing is that the grog. I'm guessing, you know, I I put myself in the pirate position, and I say to myself, what about what am I eating for the day, right? What what I'm I'm gonna I gotta get my caloric intake up, right? I wanna I wanna so you're going to be full because you had that, that heavy soup for the day with a lot of meat in it. And then someone says, ooh, and here's your grog. Mm, I'd like a spritzer. Can I just have something a little light, a little refreshing? I just want something that, that cleanses the palate. <laughs> and I think that, that they would they would have liked that. So, Indeed. Indeed yeah. they would have. Sure. Um, anyway, so uh, that's, that's uh, pretty much our show. Um, was there anything else that I wanted to mention? Uh, I don't think so. I just wanted to say thank you to our executive producers. Uh, again, without your support, the show doesn't happen. Uh, if you'd you. like to become an executive producer, please visit our Patreon page. It's patreon.com forward slash X Oriente. And you can uh, sign up, make a donation. Um, and uh, anything going on this week for you? No, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do the grand council the biennial session the tomorrow, biennial tomorrow. Session. yep good biennial session to do that tomorrow and then uh tuesday night is the big banquet it's the final kind of dealio and then uh and then next week saturday morning i got um or it's already time to rehearse kcch so uh because i'm in that cast so 
It's not, not a ton, um, but slowly now, once we hit September, lodges are back working again uh, here, and it's going to go madhouse crazy. Uh, cool. Because there's, there's a lot a lot that gets done in, in September. So, and then we go mad, uh, mad dash to December. So, Excellent. Fun. Looking forward Fun. to it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. And... Um, to get my board hopefully get my board back oh yeah and uh and we'll see you next time on x oriente take care everybody, see you, everybody. Fiat Vox. thanks everyone